Welcome to the Securities Enforcement Spring Training Web Conference Series. Uh, hello, my name is David Puglio. I'm with Foley & Lardner's Marketing Department. On behalf of Foley, I'd like to thank you all for participating in today's conference. Um, before we begin, we do have a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, today's program will last approximately one hour, followed by a short question and answer session. Uh, we encourage uh, all of our attendees to submit written questions during the program. Uh, please type your question into the Q&A widget, which is open on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, we will respond to these written questions at the end of the program, uh, time permitting. Uh, the webcast console you're looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows that you have open, including maximizing the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. Uh, if you experience any particular technical difficulties during the presentation, uh, please uh, consult the webcast help guide by clicking on the help button below the presentation window. Uh, it's designated with a uh, question mark icon. The PowerPoint presentation uh, recording will be available on our website at Foley.com within the next few days. Uh, if you'd like quick reference now, uh, you can also find a copy of the slides in the resource widget to your left. Uh, Foley will apply for CLE credit after the web conference. Uh, if you did not supply your CLE information upon registration, please send an email uh, to me, David Puglio. Uh, to be eligible, uh, you will also need to be present and logged in to this web conference uh, to answer a polling question during the program. Uh, a final note, uh, those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete an attorney affirmation form in addition to answering the polling question. A four-digit code will be announced and uh, you will need to input that code onto this form and email the form to me uh, following the program. That does it for housekeeping. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, Joseph Edmondson is a partner in Foley Securities Enforcement and Litigation and hit the Securities, Commodities, and Exchange Regulation practices. Uh, Mr. Edmondson focuses primarily on defending securities litigation and enforcement proceedings brought by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, state regulators, FINRA, and other self-regulatory organizations. Uh, Joseph Edmondson has over 20 years of experience in commercial litigation and regulatory investigations. Mark Mandel is also a partner in Foley's Securities Enforcement and Litigation Practice. He's a former chief of the New York Office of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission's Division of Broker-Dealer Enforcement with over 20 years of experience as a private practitioner focusing on complex securities-related litigation and enforcement. We're also pleased to have with us today as a guest speaker, Joseph Siders, uh, Legal Director for Charles Schwab and Company Incorporated. Uh, I turn the floor over to our speakers today and uh, wish you all a wonderful conference. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dave, for the introductions. This is Mark Mandel, and as David had mentioned, I am a partner in Foley's New York office and concentrate primarily on securities litigation and enforcement. We have a lot of ground to cover today, and we're looking forward to covering this uh, with you. Obviously, many of these topics could be covered in a separate seminar themselves, so we're going to do our best to give you practical information and get through this process uh, and allow you to collect your CLE credit at the end. Uh, so starting at the top, uh, we've used the baseball theme, and uh, in light of spring training, uh, we thought that was appropriate. So forgive us for some of the corny uh, references along the way, but we thought it would be uh, a useful tool to, to go through the program. The types of inquiries that we see these days come in all shapes and sizes, and, and now we're bombarded from various uh, corners. Uh, the SEC, obviously, through OC examinations and sweeps, you have the Division of Enforcement, which keeps us busy on a regular basis. And now FINRA, which has been growing its jurisdiction and acquiring the enforcement uh, responsibilities for a number of exchanges, is a very relevant player uh, and has grown, I think, in, in its uh, prominence from an enforcement perspective uh, over the recent five years. And I think they continue to grow and want to expand their reach. Uh, they conduct examinations. They have enforcement activity. 
Their market reg division has been active on the enforcement side. They will conduct sweeps, and uh, we've all seen them. And like I said, they come in various shapes and sizes. Um, many of the smaller matters do not make it out to outside counsel and are typically handled in-house. And again, today's program will touch on practical steps to take when confronting these. Uh, some of the more complicated enforcement matters tend to make it outside counsel, and uh, we deal with not only SEC, FINRA, DOJ, the states have joined the fray. They are very active in many respects. Uh, some states like New York, Florida, Alabama, New Jersey, Massachusetts, for example, I've, I've seen on a regular basis. And now today, with the advent of the whistleblower process, uh, both through SEC and through FINRA, uh, we're, we're seeing another source of inquiries that are stimulated from not only customer complaints, but actually uh, whistleblowers. So there's a full plate for the securities enforcement folks, both in-house and outside counsel. We like to work together and coordinate our efforts, and we believe we have some practical best practices that we can share with you today that will help you in your day-to-day. And this is Joe Edmondson. Good morning, everyone, um, in the D.C. office of Foley and Lardner. When you um, initially get a uh, inquiry letter from a regulator, um, the corny reference that we use is step up to the plate, um, the first step is, is generally to institute a document hold um, because the, um, the consequences of, uh, of losing evidence to spoliation uh, are just are just too severe to um, uh, to risk relying purely upon the uh, ordinary document retention uh, processes that uh, most regulated firms have in place. Um, you know, oftentimes clients say, "Well, I don't need to do a document hold because uh, you know, I've got 17A3 and A4, and I comply with all the FINRA rules and the exchange rules." On, uh, on document retention, so I'm good. Um, but uh, I'm here to tell you that it's really not enough because the, the problem with um, document retention processes is that, that if they're actually followed and followed to the letter of the rules, um, it's quite possible that during the course of an investigation and maybe even in the first few days of an investigation, uh, relevant material will roll off of the um, of the document retention platform, so to speak. So, for example, under under Rule 17A4, as as many of you know, if you're a, a broker dealer, uh, you have an obligation to uh, keep trading records such as trade blotters and the the core purchase and sales information for six years, but you only have the obligation to keep the confirms for three years, and uh, that also applies to correspondence and and email. So, um, you know, if if the inquiry is going to look back. Uh, to a, a particular time period, it's quite possible that you'll start losing data unless you suspend your ordinary um, processes. And that's what the uh, uh, Southern District of New York said in the Zubalaki case versus UBS Warburg back in 2003, which is kind of the seminal case on spoliation and, 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 uh, and litigation holds. So when a party reasonably anticipates litigation, it must suspend its uh, routine document retention and destruction policies and put in place a litigation hold to ensure the preservation of the relevant evidence. So uh, in this case, uh, when you get an inquiry, that is your notice of a reasonable anticipation of litigation. Um, so you want to institute a document hold that contains the key elements of identifying um, the custodians. So you need to wrap your, your mind around the request and figure out what areas of the firm it may be uh, dealing with, uh, what subject matters it may be dealing with, and think about what custodians within the firm, what individuals or, or business units are likely to have relevant information. You need to notify the IT department to suspend those automated processes that might result in the deletion or overwriting of information. Um, you should send individual hold instructions to all the affected personnel in writing. Uh, and you should be able to document that you've done so and that they've received it. Um, you should consider imaging the desktops, laptops, BDAs, and smartphones of 
of any relevant individuals. And by imaging, you know, we're taking a, a, uh, a snapshot, basically, of everything that is on those devices. So um, uh, that's not necessarily required in every case, but certainly something to consider um, if you think there might be information that's, that, that would be located in those places. And, and document, 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 because at some point you may be called upon to, to ask uh, or to answer questions about what you did to secure the evidence. So Mark, once you get the, the document hold in place, where are we going from there? Hey, Mark, I think you might be on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so getting to first base, once you have the document request in place, I think it's very important to establish a rapport with the staff and make that initial contact, introduce yourself, and explain to the staff that uh, you know, the client is, is very much inclined to cooperate fully with their investigation and take the staff's temperature to the best of your ability to learn as much as you possibly can. Um, depending upon who you're talking to, uh, you'll get varying amounts of uh, help and insight. Some staff members are very reluctant to share anything with you. Others will engage in a conversation. But I think the, the first contact is so important in order to uh, impress upon the staff members that you take their work very seriously, you take the inquiry very seriously, and that you're going to be working very hard with them in order to uh, get them whatever they need so we can move on and uh, dispose of this investigation as efficiently as possible. Uh, if you're a target of a criminal investigation, obviously you know you're a target, but uh, in our world generally we're dealing with uh, much more subtle inquiries, uh, but again, they're normally focused enough by way of the request that you can divine from what is being requested what the issues are. Uh, again, the SEC has formal orders of investigation, so if you're a recipient of a subpoena, I would immediately reach out, draft the letter that the staff requires, and obtain a copy of the formal order. Some formal orders are very obtuse, while others can provide more information, but at a minimum, you could at least see what potential violations the staff is considering uh, that, have, that have occurred. And with that information in hand, together with the document request itself, you can then go on and start matching it up with either customer complaint letters, any pending litigation, or other external events that can help shed light and give you more context in terms of what it is you're dealing with. And then again, uh, the discussion with the staff, I think, is, is essential in terms of ferreting out as much information as you can. Uh, the one thing I try very hard to do, and again, it, it, it's dependent on a, the type of case and inquiry, but generally speaking, I will like to work with a client in order to overachieve in terms of what the staff is requesting. And I think that's an excellent way to build goodwill with the staff, and that goodwill should continue to be built upon throughout the process. So if there comes a point in time where there is an issue, you can go back to that well and call upon some of the good faith that you've built up. So what I mean by that is I never want to overpromise but I want to overachieve. And with that mindset, again, depending upon the circumstances, but by and large, I think that's the best approach, you will engender goodwill with the staff and then uh, be given at least some flexibility as you move through the process. At least that's, that's the hope and the expectation. Uh, so, hey, thanks, Mark. This is Joe Siders. Again, I'm in-house counsel for Schwab. Um, looking at the header here, I guess I don't, I don't get a, a, a nice little catchy uh, baseball-related theme at the top. But anyways, um, so I guess the first step as in-house counsel, you know, it, whenever we're, we're getting a new regulatory inquiry or investigation, whatever it may be, I mean, you've, you've got to decide who your client, in it, your, your client is. As in-house counsel, um, typically I'm representing the firm. But... Um, 
you know, I'm I'm constantly assessing, and I think it's important to constantly assess and evaluate whether, you know, individuals who may be implicated in the investigation or have relevant information to share, it's important to constantly assess whether those folks need their own counsel. So once you've decided, you know, whether you're representing, at least at the outset, the firm or an individual or both, um, you then have to decide whether, you know, whether it's feasible for you, the same lawyer, to represent both of those clients. Um, we've referenced here Model Rule 1.7, which is obviously the conflict of interest rule. Um, that rule essentially says uh, there's a, a conflict if there's a significant risk that your representation of both clients is going to be materially, materially limited. Um, and I guess if you've made that determination that there's going to be a material limitation to your representation of both clients, um, you certainly, if you're going to represent both of them, you certainly need to get something in writing in terms of a joint representation letter. And what you're driving at there and what the, the rules of, of conduct are driving at are essentially getting both, you know, both clients informed consent. Um, there's no, you know, standard form uh, or magical language that you necessarily need to get, but in my experience, if I have a situation where I'm going to be representing both an individual um, or multiple clients, I'll typically reach out to somebody at Foley or, or another law firm and get the very detailed, descriptive, gory uh, joint representation letter, which lays out you know, the benefits of joint representation and also the risks of joint representation. Uh, and then moving on down, you know, as I alluded to earlier, I feel like it's it's critical to constantly evaluate and reassess whether there is a conflict, whether you know the interests of your firm and the individual at your firm um, no longer coincide. Um, that that takes place as you have conversations with employees, as you review documents, as you have conversations with the staff. I find that that to be one of the most important places where you can identify that information, you're constantly sniffing around to determine if, if an individual is in the crosshairs or potentially in the crosshairs of a regulator. And if, if, if you start to get that, that sense, um, my, personal, my personal practice is to involve outside counsel and get separate counsel for that individual sooner rather than later. Um, and moving on down, we have you know, specific instances where you, know, you might gravitate toward retaining outside counsel sooner rather than later. Obviously, where you have a situation with an employee who's violated firm policy or violated the law, I mean, that's a situation where you have, you know, a directly adverse, uh, directly adverse interest between your firm that you are in-house counsel for and the, the interests of the individuals. Um, another situation is where an employee could foreseeably provide evidence that, that, that could directly affect the firm. Um, and finally, you know, when, if, in, in particular, if you have a, somebody who's in the compliance department at your firm, and unfortunately we're seeing this more and more with regulators going after compliance folks for a firm's failure to live up to its obligations under the rules, if you have a compliance person who's in the regulator's crosshairs, I mean, an, an adverse result for that compliance professional is essentially a death knell for his or her career. So I, I, that's another instance where I pretty commonly will go to outside counsel. Um, the, the other thing that, you know, to keep in mind is as you're preparing witnesses, um, you know, you need to, you know, if you're preparing them for testimony, um, you, you need to make it very clear who you represent, um, whether you're representing them personally or representing them, you know, the, the firm. Uh, you don't want to get in a situation where you may be giving the impression to the, to the individual who's going in for testimony. And if it's not the case that you're representing them, you want to make it very, very clear that you represent the firm uh, and not the, the, the witness individually. So um, I think that covers everything on, on this slide, so I'll, I'll, pass, I'll pass it to the next person. So that's back to Joe Edmondson, so thank you, Joe. Um, at the risk of sounding like I'm the technology wonk uh, on our three-person panel, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about, uh, about what happens uh, in the process of pulling documents and, and getting documents ready for, for analysis. Uh, you know, the, with the advent of, of, of a completely email-dependent business society, 
uh, we are now faced with um, with just an avalanche of um, of electronically stored information or ESI, and um, and, and that's really uh, the driving factor behind uh, uh, many uh, regulatory inquiries these days is how you deal with with that ESI, and there and unfortunately there aren't any any easy answers. Um, but planning up front um, for, for what you're going to do and what you're going to plan to do throughout the course of an inquiry, um, whether it's a large inquiry, whether it's a small inquiry, and, 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 and what your, your game plan is can really save you a lot of headaches going forward. So the, the, the first thing you need to consider is who will conduct the poll. poll. Um, and that's the poll is, is our shorthand phrase for the document collection process. Uh, you know, are you going to try to do it internally with your own IT staff? Are you going to outsource it to a to a vendor? Um, you're going to let your uh, you're going to engage outside counsel and have them handle it. Most of the the larger firms like ours have a have a uh, uh, you know an internal function that can that can do that in the way that a vendor would. Um, and some firms might partner with a vendor to do that. Um, you know, I I think that depending upon the size of the investigation, you can you you may be able to rely upon your in-house staff to do that, but that's a business decision. Do you want to take them off of their 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 ordinary uh, activities and 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 devote them to your your special project, uh, or is it easier just to to, to outsource it? Um, but what you really need to think about, I think, is 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 how, is what you're going to do with these documents once you once you get them. So, so once you've you've figured out what it is you need to pull, and you start pulling it, um, you, the the rule of thumb that we use is that you, is that you want to handle each document, if you can, only one time. So when you when you take the documents in, uh, you're likely going to want to review them for privilege. You're likely want to review them for uh, for you know responsiveness and and and, and their content. But you're also you should try to think ahead. What are you going to do with these documents after you've produced them to the staff? Are you going to want to um, categorize them by subject matter? Are you going to want to categorize them by um, uh, with, with the potential of, of uh, having files for a witness that might go in for an interview or for testimony? Um, you know, thinking about those things up front. And, and uh, you know, could save you some headaches later um, in terms of the review process. Um, planning for production. Now, this is the, the, Mark's going to talk about this a little bit later. But um, but as you're taking the documents in, uh, you know, you have to be mindful of how they're going to go out. So if the SEC wants um, native file formats with metadata, uh, as they Sometimes do. Uh, you need to plan for that. You need to make sure you preserve all that all that metadata, and that you don't just take a an image that doesn't carry with it the the background information behind the document. Uh, or maybe you're going to negotiate that away because it's just too burdensome to do that. Um, you know, everything's on the table, and it's and it requires a a little bit of uh, expertise and, and and advanced thought as to as to how these things are going to shake out. And again, there are no no easy answers. Um, once you get the documents into the uh, whatever review environment you're going to you're going to use, and there are many of them, uh, you know, available for electronic documents, uh, then you're going to want to uh, analyze them with a with an eye towards you know where the case is going and how you're going to potentially defend it. So, Mark, you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. And again, thanks to technology today, we can pretty much slice and dice and call upon for various different types of requests uh, to seek out, take voluminous amounts of documents and, and actually pare them down into what become, in our view, the most relevant and most important documents. And we can do this in advance of a production with an eye towards hopefully narrowing the production to avoid producing potentially problematic documents. Uh, even if they don't bear on the issue that is subject to the request. Uh, other times, at least, we need to be ahead of the curve, right? So this is your opportunity to master what information there is, what, about, what it is you're about to turn over, so you can be, again, two steps ahead of, of, of the enforcement team uh, in reviewing these, 
these documents and coming to grips with where the problems lie, if any. And then obviously making the best use when you're interviewing the key players uh, of, the, of those documents, either showing and sharing them with them or if strategically that's not appropriate, but at least asking questions around them to see what types of answers you're getting. And again, formulating the context around now the request that you received and now the, the inquiry is starting to take shape and you're starting to put meat on the bones. Um, I like, depending upon the situation again, but frequently many of these matters are, are not the first ones that are being conducted by the enforcement staff that you're dealing with. And I like to reach out to a group of folks uh, in the enforcement bar, both inside counsel, outside counsel, on a no-names basis to say, hey, are you dealing with a matter that involves such and such from FINRA or this from the SEC? Because at that point in time, you frequently get excellent information. Oh, yeah, we are dealing with that, and uh, we're at this phase right now. Where are you? And then we compare notes, and we can work together. And again, on a no-names basis, so you're not giving away anything. And it's oftentimes very helpful in order to gear up and prepare for what is going to be coming around the corner. So I, I encourage folks to utilize their network, uh, reach out to folks that you trust, and make a discreet inquiry in terms of what it is they can do to help you, again, add meat to the bones so you can understand better where this case is likely headed. And when it involves numerous industry participants, I think more often than not, it makes sense to reach out to those folks at the respective firms and figure out who, if anybody, is in the same boat and work jointly with them because it oftentimes is better to pre present a, a uniform defense as opposed to having a firm that's an outlier that goes off and does something that may have negative implications for the rest of the group. So again, these are all practical uh, tips that I would encourage those to pursue to the extent you're not doing so already. Are you cooperating? Uh, cooperation has become uh, more and more prominent. Uh, I'm still of the view that, uh, well, the jury's still out in terms of whether or not this could be a home run or a, or a hit by pitch. Um, FINRA, for example, insists on cooperation from its registered persons and entities, and they're duty-bound to cooperate. So when it comes to FINRA, their view of what is credible cooperation is extraordinary cooperation, and the definition is often an elusive one in my, uh, in my experience. There have been times where I've had a client who wanted to self-report an issue. We've gone in, we've self-reported, and uh, the staff pretends that they have given us credit, but there's really no objective way of, of deciphering whether or not any such credit was applied other than maybe a reference in an AWC. At other times, gone down the same path and actually have received a pass uh, from an enforcement action uh, based on a self-report and based on cooperation. Um, most often, uh, we find ourselves in a situation where we are cooperating and doing everything that the regulator is asking, but we may not be reaching that level of extraordinary cooperation. Uh, and again, I've been involved in some very recent matters where, uh, based on settlements that were published, uh, we, you know, the client appeared to be engaging in uh, activities that would have met the extraordinary cooperation that was referenced in the AWCs of the prior settled matters, but yet the staff was acting as though we didn't reach that level and therefore we weren't entitled to it. Um, cooperation is, uh, you know, it's a tricky subject. You know, you know the Seaboard report that was put out. The SEC uh, more recently came out with uh, a program that approaches what the Justice Department and the U.S. Attorney's offices do. That was under Rob Kuzami's uh, leadership when he became the Director of Enforcement at the SEC. There have been some uh, deferred prosecutions and non-prosecution agreements, but by and large, I think it's still a difficult subject matter for the SEC. And uh, as I said, with FINRA, you have to have an open mind when you're dealing with them in terms of trying to measure what, if any, credit you're going to be getting uh, short of just open kimono, walking in and 
doing whatever it is they ask you to do. And it's very rare that we're in a position to do something like that. Yeah, Mark, this is Joe. Um, I mean, I just second all of those comments. I mean, there's, we, we've been in some recent matters where it's it's just a very, very complicated issue. On one hand, you have kind of what, it, what, what feels like a very black box type approach where, you know, FINRA or, or the SEC, you know, they kind of no cooperation when they see it. And, you, you know, it's very difficult to discern what, if any, benefit you're actually getting from from cooperating and how your level of cooperation may differ from, you know, the firm that was in two days prior to you. You know, so you could see an AWC where one firm gets credit uh, in an AWC for extraordinary cooperation. And it's very, very difficult to, to determine or understand, you know, what that prior firm may have done that was different from what you did. Um, certainly we're all trying, we're duty bound and we're trying to cooperate, but it, it's, it's very complicated and tricky because it, it, on, on the, the flip side, you're, you're in an adversarial state with, with your regular. Oftentimes you're in a negotiating posture and FINRA is telling you um, oftentimes as a negotiating tactic that your firm is, you know, is delaying, it's taking too long, they're not giving getting the level of cooperation that they were expecting and therefore, you know, their 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 settlement demand is much, much higher than it would have been if you had if you had been cooperating. And, you know, so it's difficult to understand from Finder's perspective where they're shaking out because they're they're doing what you're doing, which is negotiating and trying to get the best result possible for their client. Um but on the other hand, you know, cooperation is also a reputational issue. I mean, I'm sure Joe and Mark will attest. I mean, we're dealing with the same cast of characters at the SEC and FINRA oftentimes. So, you know, if you're dealing with them on one matter, I, I mean, we run into the same enforcement attorneys on other matters. And if you if you have a reputation or your firm has a reputation for being, you know, maybe dilatory or on the flip side, being very, very cooperative and open, I think that reputation carries over from one matter to another. I agree, Mark. That's in part of the cooperate. I'm um, and, and Joe. Part of the cooperation, um, what, what is going to inform your analysis as to how you're gonna, whether you're gonna cooperate, whether you're going to, uh, um, you know, throw down and vigorously defend um, this thing, or uh, cooperate, maybe try to reach a settlement. And you know, your defense strategy is it really has to be informed. Um, by your your uh, legal analysis, um, and that's a difficult thing to do when you're dealing with the SEC, FINRA, the exchanges, because so much of the precedent, and I'm I'm making air quotes in, that you can't see right now, um, so much of the precedent is settled cases, uh, and it's 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 a difficult thing. Uh, to try to tease out of those settled cases the um, you know the operative um, you know facts that really drive the case. So you know you have orders instituting proceedings at the SEC. You've got your AWCs at FINRA. Um, you know similar uh, consents uh, at the states. Um, but but you don't have all that many litigated cases. Certainly in the SEC realm, you have more litigated. Uh, cases, including in court, than you do um, than you do at FINRA. Um, you've got other sources of information. You have you know guidance documents. You have notices to members. Um, you have things that the uh, you know commissioners that the SEC may have said that might uh, you might be able to use to to inform your judgment. But you, you really have to dig in and, uh, and 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 try to get all the the relevant um, precedent. And then apply it to the to the facts that you've that you've analyzed. So you know on the base path we put this you know somewhere between between first and second uh, first and second base. You know you're trying you're trying to get your hands around this, you're trying to understand what's going on, what actually happened factually, what the implications of that are for for your firm legally, and then trying to figure out what kind of a of a consequence you may be facing from a from a sanction perspective. Um, you know, is this a hundred thousand dollar fine case? Is this a million dollar fine case? Uh, is this a, a ten thousand dollar fine case? Um, is it something that you could reduce to a no fine case if you make some kind of a of a, of a remedial act 
and, and do it magnanimously uh, and proactively to the, to the staff. Um, you know, these are all things that you need to, need to be considering, um, you know, early on in the case before uh, you really know what the staff is, is fully thinking about your, um, about your client. Um, so once you have an idea of what's, of what's happened in the case factually, where you stand legally, um, you know, Joe, how, how do you decide, you know, whether you're going to act proactively to, to take a remedial act or, or, or just or wait until later on in the process? Well, I mean, speaking for, I mean, my practice is generally to, to, to act. Um, and it, action takes various formats. I mean, but, but I'm at least reaching out to the compliance department at the business unit that's affected, um, sitting down and talking with the folks who are doing the activity that's under review every day, looking at their written procedures, which is, you know, a lot of fun, but it's it's a necessary thing. You know, because FINRA, the SEC, all of these SROs are so focused on, you know, your written procedures and the adequacy thereof, et cetera, et cetera. So at, at least, at the very least, I'm I'm sitting down with folks and looking at their procedures and making updates or changes, making things clearer, um, writing things in a, in, a, in a more straightforward manner or elaborating on the, the procedures that are carried out, um, and, you know, documenting that. I mean, so FINRA seems to be particularly interested in, in, in seeing evidence that legal compliance and the business have gotten together sat down, discussed it, and, you know, decided on an outcome. And sometimes, you know, I could look at their procedures and we all decide that, you know, these, these are these are pretty airtight. These these don't these don't need a lot of updating. And if that's the case, then I'll at least document with folks that we've taken a look at them and decided that no corrective action was necessary. But in a lot of the cases, I mean I'm at least updating procedures because FINRA really seems to appreciate that. Um, in terms of, you know, taking some type of remedial action like refunding customers. It's not a situation that I deal with a lot, but we have run across it. That, you know, that that carries a lot of implications. I mean, you're you're then involving the business. It's not only, you know, how it's going to play with your regulator, but it's, but it's also a, a business issue, um, and, it you know, it, it directly affects that side. So that complicates the discussion greatly. Uh, and in terms of, you know, whether we're going to terminate an employee or, or subject him or her to heightened supervision. Um, in my experience, I mean, termination is an absolutely, you know, that, that's a, a last-ditch uh, action. I mean, there are so many ducks that need to be lined up before uh, we would take that, that type of action. Um, heightened supervision is something we do a little bit more frequently because, you know, just because someone is under heightened supervision does not necessarily mean that there's, you know, that there's a need for it. It could just be, you know, you're the subject of an in examination or investigation. Uh, we don't think you did anything wrong, but we're going to, you know, have your supervisor understandably, you know, maybe maybe help you out or, or, or keep a closer eye on your day-to-day -day activities, not necessarily suggesting or implying that you've done something wrong. But in the regulator's eyes, if they're concerned about an individual, heightened supervision is, is, is a fairly easy uh, and, and quick fix that, that they seem to respect. And, and Joe, do you, do you think that the uh, requirement to report to FINRA uh, under 4530 uh, heightened supervision or other limitations that substantially limit the activities of an individual, it, it all chills the firm's uh, decision-making on that, or is it neutral? I'm sorry, or is it what, neutral? Yeah, is it, it does it chill? Does it affect your decision making one way or the other? It definitely it, it definitely does. I mean, you know, it, if if nothing else, I mean, you've got the individual who's there, uh, obviously voicing a very strong opinion about about you know his or her forty, you know, the 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 reporting on his or her record. Um, but you know, in the in the grand scheme of things, my interests are the firms in most of these cases, and if if I think that protecting the firm. And advancing the firm's interests, you know, we could do that, accomplish that by by putting somebody under heightened supervision. Um, that's typically what I'm going to recommend because my my interests are the firms. And before you, I know you're going to go on to reporting on the next slide, but before you leave that, I just wanted to interject that I I think that the states are particularly sensitive to customer refunds. Um, you know, maybe others have different uh, experiences, but. 
but I find that as soon as you roll out a customer refund, that really impresses the state, maybe more so than, than FINRA or the SEC. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, and I would add this, that in my experience now, FINRA has been more inclined to require some sort of uh, remuneration back, um, so refunds to customers where there are losses. Let's say you're talking about a, a complex product that uh, they felt was sold to folks who couldn't comprehend the product. Um, I've seen in almost every instance they're, they're demanding some sort of refund, which, in my experience, has then triggered some interest from the state saying, hmm, if I have some constituents that reside in my state, uh, is there something I can do to uh, jump on that bandwagon? And uh, that frequently ignites uh, a handful of inquiries from various states in order to pursue what they think is low-hanging fruit. And that would be consistent with what Brad Bennett said at SIFMA that it, 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 several times that his primary mission is to uh, – is to protect individual investors. Now, that may be a difficult pill for trading firms and other uh, uh, proprietary operations to, to swallow as they also undergo heavy, heavy FINRA scrutiny, but uh, I agree. So I guess if we're ready, to, I, Joe, you alluded to, I guess we'll move on to the next slide. Um, which dovetails nicely, but I think we're, we're running a little bit short, so I'll, I'll try to, to buzz through this slide. Um, but Joe, Mark, obviously, if, if, if I've glossed over anything, feel free to interrupt. But in terms of disclosure issues, obviously, as, as uh, you know, operating in a heavily regulated industry, and a lot of us are, are public companies, um, we have a lot of internal and external reporting obligations. Um, I, I just spoke about kind of the internal reporting, you know, alerting supervisors to issues with people that they're with, fo to, with folks that they're supervising, putting people on heightened supervision if it's appropriate. Circumstances dictate that. Um, you know, for 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 my client, um, you know, in terms of reporting up to the board, we have a ton. It seems a ton of subcommittees, audit committees, who are constantly tracking and keeping tabs of. Various matters because you know whatever state they're in, the matter is in, um, you know, could ultimately have a material effect on the firm, both financially, you know, and reputationally. So, um, you know, I'm I'm constantly updating various committees and providing little snippets on on matters. Um, another thing, you know, we've talked about the form BD. We've I guess we've alluded to U4s and U5s. Um, you know, and that's another reason why keeping everybody in the loop in terms of the progress of the investigation, keeping folks apprised of your conversations with staff. Um, you know, if, if you get a sense that the direction that the investigation is headed in a slightly different direction or if it's if it's starting to touch on a particular individual that has, you know, very, very serious implications for his or her that individual's career, obviously that U four um, you know, compliance needs to know so they can determine whether the U four needs to be updated. Um, you know, with the increased oversight by the Fed, um, we're getting more and more calls from our accounting folks, um, you know, in terms of how do we need to reserve for a particular matter. I mean, the Fed is constantly asking uh, about regulatory matters and whether the firm is properly reserved for that, and they seem to be very, very interested in, 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 in that question. So keeping your accounting folks is another thing that you got to constantly think about. Um, one other thing, I mean, and this is, as an in-house person, um, I, I think this is actually one of the most important things just in terms of your own self-preservation. I mean, you don't want to forget disclosure to your insurers. Um, you know, if, if you've incurred money in defense costs, um, you know, in, in, in defense of a regulatory matter, and then only after the fact, have you, do you realize or do, does, does, does your insurance, does your risk department come to you and say, hey, uh, tell me about that such and such regulatory matter. You know, we have coverage for that. If if you only realize that after the fact, I mean, that's not a conversation that you want to have with your boss or with the general counsel. Um, so it's just, it, it, it just underlie, underscores the, the need to keep so many different business units apprised of, of the progress of the investigation. Mark, Joe, anything to add before I move on? No, I, I think we're covered. Okay, so we'll move on. Third base. 
getting to third base. Uh, we're now rounding second. We're on our way to third. And now we're dealing with the scope of the response. Uh, always a good practice to negotiate as best you can to narrow and prioritize the requests that you receive. Um, I can't tell you how many times you're involved in a case where the cost of responding to the request can dwarf what an ultimate sanction looks like. And um, there, many times the staff member is either inexperienced or narrow-minded to the point where they draft these monster requests which calls upon the firm to retrieve either millions of transactions or worse, you know, a huge volume of email which somebody is going to have to review prior to production not only for privilege but for the content and substance. Um, that's a discussion that needs to be had if you run into a brick wall with the initial staff members. I think it's imperative that you take that conversation up the chain until you get some satisfaction. Uh, what I like to do is, um, at least in the first instance, negotiate with, with the staff and arrive at something that at least is reasonable to start without prejudice to the staff to renew and come back for more. So if they've asked for six years' worth of email, we try to pare it down to six months with the right to go back and seek additional email, or I'll frequently explain to the staff that, you know, we've done a preliminary search and it calls for umpteen, you know, megabytes of data and that would probably equate to, you know, so many hundreds of thousands of emails. Even if I gave it to you, I don't think you're ever going to get through it. So let's talk about search terms and come up with things that can be efficient, practical, and, and utilize them in order to get the staff what it needs in order to do, conduct its investigation while at the same time spare the client the pain of a seven-figure tab of uh, getting this information to the staff, which much of which they probably will not be utilizing. So uh, embedded in all this is obviously the, uh, the responsibility of counsel to review the documents prior to production, not only to protect privilege, but also to have a keen sense of what is being provided to, to the regulators. And the difficult issues obviously arise when you're dealing with extraordinary volume, either trading volume, uh, transactions, or email, instant messages, and the like. And it's not unusual to enter into the clawback arrangements with the regulators in the event that uh, you make a misstep and, God forbid, produce inadvertently documents that otherwise should have been held back for one privilege or another. Uh, Another thing that we frequently use, of course, is uh, agreeing to a rolling production. So when the volume is such that it's inconceivable that even if the firm dropped everything on its plate and focused on this particular request as if it was the only request that we're dealing with and the regulators know it's otherwise, uh, it would still take weeks or sometimes months to gather this information, review it, and get it in shape in order to be produced. Uh, you then ask them for what their priorities are, try to focus on those priorities, get them the documents as quickly as possible, but only after they've been thoroughly reviewed and vetted for privilege. Um, these sorts of issues uh, can get very contentious and uh, sometimes require you to go as far up the chain as, as need be in order to plead your case, but uh, it's definitely worth the phone call in my opinion. I've had a number of occasions where the staff was digging in their heels about one thing or another and seeking just ungodly amounts of email or trading data, and then we've, we were successful once we got up the chain to pare it back substantially. Um, again, I think it's very much worth the phone call. Uh, the other point that I want to come back to is what I had said at, at early on, which is you don't want to overpromise, but you want to over overachieve. And I can't underscore that enough. I think that's what resonates with the staff. That's what makes them feel that you're taking them seriously. And that will, I think, help when you have time for these negotiations for them to be more flexible rather than be rigid. And uh, I just wanted to reiterate that. So after the documents are produced, we move on usually to a phase where the staff will seek to interview or take testimony from uh, individual witnesses. And there are basically three kinds of, 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 of testimony. Um, uh, voluntary interviews, um, which are, tend to be informal. Uh, OTRs, which is the, you know, what happens usually at FINRA. 
uh, on the record interviews which are recorded um, by a court reporter and uh, an oath is administered um, and then you know at the SEC you can have uh, certainly have voluntary interviews over the telephone um, but if the if the staff is going to administer an oath and take the testimony on the record you know that's done through the issuance of a of a subpoena uh, to to the witness um, and you know depending upon the the the, the type of testimony uh, you know you you may deal with it uh, differently now this entire presentation is based uh, predominantly uh, on an on a inquiry that's a cause inquiry, that's a targeted inquiry. We're not really dealing with the ordinary um, routine cycle exam process. Um, you know, in the cycle exam process, the, the examiners may be asking questions of, of employees um, continuously throughout the course of the exam, you know, calling them in, asking them questions, and, 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 and so forth. You know, I, I, just to pause on that for a quick second, uh, you know, I think it's incumbent upon who's ever managing that process, which is usually the would be compliance rather than legal, but perhaps with some legal uh, oversight, you know, to make sure that anybody that's going to be communicating with the staff is, uh, you know, credible, competent, well-spoken, understands, uh, you know, the rules of the road regarding answer, answering regulatory inquiries, not volunteering information not asked for, uh, and, and, and so forth. Those rules of the road also apply to, uh, on the record testimony, of course, in a, in a, in a, in a more uh, heightened way. But you know, the one rule of thumb that many clients use, and that, and that you know, I think is a good idea, is that if, if the client is going to be put on the record, uh, administered an oath, subject to the penalties of perjury, uh, if it's the government involved, like the SEC or a government, a government agency, they're going to be subject to the false statements to Government Act, either federally or under state anal uh, analog. Um, you know, I think that that situation, there ought to be counsel present and representing uh, the interests of the witness. Along with that, there should be preparation beforehand. Um, the witness should not be going into on the record um, under oath testimony um, cold. Um, and, and one of the problems that, that we have seen emerge over the years is that the, is that the lines are sometimes blurred with regarding um, uh, whether the uh, examination, um, uh, wh whether the call for on-the-record testimony is really arising in an enforcement inquiry or is advising, uh, arising in an examination context. Um, you know, I think that we're seeing on-the-record testimony used a lot more uh, in the examination context where there may or may not be enforcement um, uh, pending, or, or not pending, but uh, um, you know, uh, coming up or being considered by the by the regulator, and that just puts the uh, the witness in the firm in an uncomfortable situation. And and, and Joe, so you know, do, do you do you agree? What do you what do you think about outside counsel uh, uh, when you, when you have the specter of possible uh, enforcement uh, interest in the investigation? Yeah, I mean, when personal practice is if we're, if somebody's expected to go in and give on the record testimony, I mean. Nine times out of ten may not be strong enough. I mean, we're we're bringing in outside counsel. I will, I personally will sit in on all the prep, and will sit in during the the actual examination, the during the testimony. But um, when it's escalated to that level, um, there are just so many issues percolating that we feel, you know, my firm feels that it's it, it's appropriate at that time to bring in outside counsel. The risks of, you know the witness not being sufficiently prepared, the witness not feeling as if he or she has been sufficiently prepared or that the firm is taking this seriously enough. Um, in the current climate, I mean, at least in my experience, individuals get incredibly spooked when, you know, they get that, that request for on-the-record testimony. And, you know, not only strategically in terms of protecting both the firm and, the, you know, potentially the individual, but just from a psychological standpoint, you know, the, the concept of the firm going out, paying to retain outside counsel who's coming in and is, you know, an expert in this field and has done this a hundred times before, I find it gives the witness a ton of comfort. Um, and, and it also helps impress upon the witness the, the severity of the issue and how serious they need to be taking the, the issue. So, most more often than not, we're bringing an outside counsel when it's when on the record testimony is requested. 
Great. So once the interviews or the testimony is, is, is concluded, Mark, how do we get home safely? Well, uh, oh. that brings us... I'm sorry, we got the CLE code. <laughs> okay. Yeah, at this time, uh, we're going to, to take the CLE code for the program. Um, if you're in need of CLE for today, um, I'm going to read out a four-digit code, and I'll just need you to answer that in the uh, box here. The code for today is J V eight or J eight V nine. Pardon me. And you'll be, you'll be. So again, that is J as in Joseph eight V as in Victor nine. Yeah, please put post that into the box and click submit. As a reminder, uh, for those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit, um, in addition to the polling question, you will need to complete the attorney affirmation form, a copy of which is in the resource widget, which by default is on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, please fill that form out, uh, include, the, include the code, and email that to myself. My name is uh, David Puglio, and my email address is d. P-U-L-E-O at Foley.com, and I'll be posting that as well here. All right, I'm going to leave this up for another uh, 15 seconds here, and then we will uh, return the program to our speakers. All right, thank you very much, and uh, the program will return now. Which brings us back to getting home safely. I, I think the, the important points to underscore with regard to this concept is pre-Wells discussions, particularly if you're talking about an individual, right? Because if an individual is involved and they receive a Wells notice, the, the common thinking is that uh, that person is pretty much done, there's a U4 uh, you know, disclosure that is attached to the well. So what I like to do when individuals are involved is at the appropriate point in, in a discussion with the staff is, is remind them that you're advocating on behalf of the client, you don't see any issues, but to the extent the staff somehow arrives at a different conclusion, you would want to have a further discussion with them before anything becomes more formalized. And they will understand that to mean that you want to talk to them before a Wells is issued. Um, and I've been fortunate that in each and every instance where I've made this request, the staff has requested it, I mean has honored the request. Uh, I've read about other situations where that isn't always the case, but uh, fortunately, like I said, that's been respected and it's something that I think is incredibly important, particularly from an individual standpoint, that you get that understanding and you make sure you underscore it early. The other issue is prior to a Wells, uh, what I like to try to do is a pre-Wells because it avoids the SEC's Wells clock. They seem to like that. Uh, and it also gives us an opportunity to engage on a substantive basis with the staff without the formality of the Wells and the, the response that they likely will have to write and so on and so forth with the view towards narrowing the issues or hopefully eliminating the issues if you're successful. Um, one thing that I wanted to also point out in this context is, depending upon the case, if it's a high-profile matter, if it's a large, complex case, if there's risk of attendant civil litigation on the outside, you want to be very careful, and we'll be talking about the Wells response in the next slide, but you want to be careful, and you may want to use a pre-Wells discussion to come in and do an oral presentation uh, or a white paper, which you can apply different restrictions to than a Wells, which would not necessarily be discoverable, and those are advantages that you may seek to take when you're dealing with a situation that may be larger than just dealing with this particular regulator. You have to think broader in many instances and, and wonder who's coming up next and who are we dealing with next and do we want to serve up anything in writing that will be discoverable and lay out uh, the roadmap to the defense or to the issues. Uh, this is frequently a big issue with individuals because um, in discovery, if their Wells responses become public, 
as many did in, for example, the CDO cases and the like, uh, there are numerous articles written about who was charged with what and da 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 da, da. These are things that you want to pay careful attention to. And again, uh, the concept that we're going to deal with now in the next slide with the wells is if you're not going to fight, uh, that's one issue, but if you're inclined to hunker down and go to the mat, uh, do you really want to hand them your litigation strategy in a, in a written document that they can obviously work around? Right. So when the the, you know, the Wells process is uh, you know, named after uh, former Commissioner Joseph Wells, um, and uh, originally the SEC, and then Finra kind of adopted its own version of the of the SEC uh, process. And there's there's nothing you know magical about it. The uh, the you receive a notification, usually a telephone call from the from the staff. Um, but sometimes you learn about it in in in, in written form first, um, but always followed up by a a, a written letter. Um, and I think that the, the the point where you receive your Wells notice, uh, you know, whether you're handling this internally or whether there's outside counsel involved, you the the thing you need to do is try to extract from the staff as much information as you possibly can regarding the staff's um, theory of the case. Hopefully, if you've done your Document review and analysis um, beforehand, you will have you know plenty of context to understand what they're what they're talking about. But 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 really grill them um, for as much information as you can possibly get. You know you're going to have an opportunity um, to review uh, the testimony certainly of of your witnesses. Um, you know purchase the transcripts of any of any witnesses that that. Um, um, that were represented and, and review the transcripts of any other witnesses. Um, we get as much access to the overall record as you can. FINRA will provide you usually with a little bit more access than the SEC will, but you know, the, the, this all goes back to having that great rapport that Mark talked about. You know, if you if you go into a Wells process with a lot of rapport, you're going to do much better than if you've um, you know fought them every step of the way and, and not developed that rapport. You want to update your legal analysis. You know, see if there's anything new that's going to be a game changer in terms of precedent or or recent settlements. Um, and then you have to decide whether you're going to submit that well submission, as Mark said. Um, you know, the well submission. If you don't settle the case, the well submission could be a roadmap to your defense that could could allow the staff to draft a very very tight complaint against you, anticipating all of your defenses. Um, but you know, you may not know whether or not you you, you want to litigate until you see what the settlement process looks like. Um, so, uh, well submissions, Joe, are uh, you know incredibly expensive if outside counsel drafts them in a large case. But you know, what are the options for the firm in terms of of, of dealing with the well submission preparation process? Well, I mean, one option is for you know in-house counsel to take a a, a larger role in preparing them. I mean. Personally, I, I I oftentimes, if the matter is not a large matter or you know involving a, a large number of OTRs, you know, a huge discovery record, the matter is fairly it's small. There's no that we're minimal risk of attendant civil litigation. Um, we anticipate settling the matter. Ultimately, we've gotten every indication from the staff that they want to settle it. And uh, an, an option that we utilize a lot is for myself just to prepare the Wells response. Um, and that obviously saves a ton of money because it, you know, the Wells responses that outside counsel prepare are fantastic, but they are extremely expensive. And for a lot of the matters that we're dealing with, um, you know, they're not huge seven-figure fines type cases. Um, and you know, instead of dropping, you know, however much money you're going to drop on outside counsel preparing a Wells response, oftentimes the business will say, "Look, prepare something." Put us in the best posture possible for settlement talks, but you know we're not going to we're not going to devote the fifty grand or whatever to outside counsel to prepare the Wells response. You know that's something that we would rather allocate towards an ultimate settlement. Um, so it really you know just depends on the scope of the matter, um, what what the regular or what you anticipate the regular looking for in terms of a fine, and then I think Mark Mark noted. I mean you've got to consider that risk of tag along civil litigation. Um, before you're submitting something that could become discoverable at a later point. Great, good, good advice. Good advice. So, so Mark, how, can we settle the case? 
we have, this is the last slide, folks, and if you have questions, please um, get, you hit the Q&A tab and, and put them in. We've got a couple in the queue already that we'll answer here at the end, but go ahead, Mark. Yeah, and again, just to hit the high notes with regard to the settlement negotiation issues, today, obviously, at times we may be dealing with a scenario where we're being asked to admit more often than not, it's still, thankfully, neither admit nor deny. Uh, you always have to consider what collateral consequences may flow from such a settlement, whether waivers are available, are they obtainable, are they automatic, what are the risks. Um, if you find yourself in a situation where the staff is being unreasonable and they're not uh, at least offering you a settlement that at least comports in your mind with what is reasonable and fair, you absolutely have to take it up the chain, go up the chain of command, uh, one by one if need be until you exhaust your remedies up the top and have it out with them and explain to them in, in, uh, in very coherent terms why it is you're being treated unfairly and, and why it should be that your, your view of it should be embraced by the staff as opposed to what the staff is insisting upon. Uh, frequently you get relief as you go up. They're less invested. Sometimes the staff level members are so drunk on their own Kool-Aid they refuse to relent, and they uh, will, of course, have to relent when and if you go up the chain and somebody more senior tells them that, yeah, this, this is not right. We've got to sort of bring it in line. Um, you always want to negotiate editorial rights. If you're going to settle in principle, you want to condition it on the right to review and comment on the order and get as much uh, editorial rights either with respect to an SEC order or an AWC with FINRA. Uh, you also can argue for no press. If you're fortunate enough, if there is going to be press, you want to make sure that you've watered down the order or the AWC to such benign language that they won't go hog wild with you on a press release. And you should be viewing the press release at the same time you're looking at the proposed language for the order, and they should comport with one another as opposed to be, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to see a spicy press release that's going to be sexy when you have an order that you've been able to negotiate. And, and this is the way that you're able to minimize, hopefully, the best of your ability, the, the reputational harm that may flow from the public uh, disclosure of the particular settlement at issue. And that wraps it up. Of course, it goes without saying that the other option is to litigate, but boy, that's, that's, a, that's two hours of discussion. Uh, <laughs> we, we did get a question. Um, what are the requirements for updating information during the pendency of an, of an OC audit? So um, I'm, I'm going to uh, assume that the questioner is, you know, we're dealing with a, an OC, um, uh, you know, ordinary e examination. It's not, it's not targeted. There's no subpoena and so forth. Um, so uh, the requirement for updating information you know, kind of goes back to the to the beginning of the um, of the exam. So during the exam, you're going to get your your uh, your requests at the beginning of the exam, and hopefully those requests will have uh, you know some kind of a, a, a defined scope to them. And if they don't, um, you know you want to define the scope so that there's no um, uh, no question as to what you know, time period you're dealing with or, what, or whatever. But I think that the, the question maybe raises a, a, a more important practical consideration is that, you know, my view is that you don't want to be playing cat and mouse with your primary regulator. Um, you know, if, if, if information comes up that's relevant to the examination that you haven't um, provided, um, you know, I, I think that it, it's, uh, um, you know, whether it's Specifically called for under the letter of the request that you you provided. I think you have to you have to think about um, at least think very seriously about providing that you know proactively um, you know to the staff. So for example, if if you know if you just put in a this is an easy example, but if you just put a procedure change, if you just provided procedures to the examiner that have now gone out of date a month later because you just updated the procedures. You, you give them the updated procedures. It's it's uh, you know that's that's a no brainer. Uh, you know if it's if something if you discover something that um, uh, you know is, is is relevant that is harmful, um, you know that may be a a, a tougher a tougher call. Um, but uh, you know I, I I don't I think that you don't necessarily have to. Um, uh, not going to be required to do it, but I think it might be in the right case in your interest to to do it. But it depends on the facts and circumstances. 
Uh, another question was directed to Mark, and that is, Mark, you were at the SEC, so what does the SEC think about the coordination that occurs within joint defense groups? Doesn't the staff think that joint defense groups are designed to line up everyone's story and obscure the truth? Uh, well, since I, even when I was at the commission, I couldn't speak for the commission, and now that I've left, I don't know that I could speak for them, but I can give you my experience. And I think at this point, and it's probably been for the past, I don't know, five or more years, I, I think the staff has gotten more comfortable with that. I think earlier on, as joint defense groups started to come into fashion, there was that uh, heavy dose of skepticism from the SEC staff. I think now they recognize, I think more and more members of the staff have been inside and outside and have the experience and understand that uh, it happens and it's not nefarious. And unless it's an unusual situation and one that I've never been involved in, it's not because everybody's trying to line up uh, each other's story and conform testimony, but rather it's just a sharing arrangement to put yourself on the same uh, level playing field that the, the staff is on. Um, so. Again, I would say that in my experience, by and large, uh, they recognize, certainly the senior members of, of enforcement certainly recognize that uh, joint defense groups are fairly commonplace. Uh, and in many respects, they may be helpful because working through a joint defense group, we're able to frequently get information and narrow issues for the staff and work actually more efficiently than if there were not a joint defense arrangement. Um, so I, I think there is some upside for the staff with regard to joint defense arrangements. I think they're comfortable with them, and unless it's a, a unique situation, I would uh, I would expect that they respect it. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions coming up. Uh, Joe Siders, do you have any? Additional comment on either uh, either of those questions? Uh, no, I mean, uh, no, no. Mark's comment about the SEC is certainly more informed than, than anything coming from me would be. Well, you know, I'll just m mention that uh, you know, we, we at Finra, at least, we we now have the three most senior members of the enforcement division all were outside counsel and probably were active participants in joint defense groups. So um, it's going to be hard for them to to take an adverse uh, view of, of joint defense groups. Um, all right. Well, I think that that's it for questions. Um, you know, I think we want to thank everybody for attending. And uh, certainly, if you think of anything that comes up in your mind, uh, you listen to this later or review the slides. You know, you feel free to reach out to any of us if we can be of assistance to you and um, you know, look forward to uh, additional webinars that are going to be upcoming in this uh, in this series even once we get out of the spring training so uh, Mark uh, thanks and Joe thanks uh, anything to add no just want to thank everybody for their attendance and uh, Joe you and and Joe both for your participation All right, Dave, that concludes the speaker's portion of the presentation. Thanks, everybody. And thank you. Uh, at the conclusion here, when we close out, a survey will uh, appear. Uh, I just would like to ask our attendees to take a minute or two to give us our feedback about the presentation today. Um, uh, it's important for us to know your thoughts, and it helps us shape our, our presentations going forward and to provide a more uh, efficient and pleasant experience and more uh, informative one as well. So please take the time to fill out the survey and we wish you all a, a wonderful day. Thank you.